Our story begins in the aftermath of the glorious revolution of 1688, when King James II was overthrown and replaced by his daughter Mary and her husband, William of Orange, who became joint rulers. But before getting into the events leading up to the last major Jacobite rising in 1746, let's talk about who or what a Jacobite actually was. So the term Jacobites refers to the supporters of the exiled Stuart's dynasty's claim to the British throne. The Jacobite movement emerged during the late 17th and 18th centuries and gained prominence particularly after the Glorious Revolution of 1688. The name Jacobite is derived from the Latin form of James, which is Jacobus. The movement's supporters believed in the legitimacy of the Stuart claim to the throne, specifically that James II and his descendants were the rightful rulers of England, Scotland, and Ireland. The Jacobite cause gained traction mainly among those who opposed the Protestant succession that was established by the Glorious Revolution and who wished to restore a Catholic monarch to the throne. The movement was particularly strong in Scotland and Ireland, where Catholicism had a significant presence and where the Stuarts had traditionally enjoyed support. Throughout the 18th century, there were several uprisings and attempts by the Jacobites to overthrow the reigning Protestant monarchs and restore the Stuarts to power, but before we go there, let's go here and talk about the son of the deposed king. James Francis Edward Stuart, commonly known as the Old Pretender, was a prominent figure in the Jacobite cause and a claimant to the British throne. He was born on June 10, 1688, in London, England, as the son of King James II and his second wife, Mary of Modena. His history is closely intertwined with the events of the Glorious Revolution and the Jacobite risings that followed. James Francis Edward Stuart was born into a Catholic family, and his birth was a significant event that heightened the fears of a Catholic succession. It played a crucial role in galvanizing opposition to his father, King James II. In 1688, when he was just a few months old, his father was overthrown by William of Orange and his daughter Mary. The Protestant establishment viewed the infant James as a threat to their religious and political interests. Following the Glorious Revolution, his family fled to France in November, where he was raised in the court of his cousin, King Louis XIV. James received an education befitting a future monarch and grew up with a strong sense of his own legitimacy as the rightful heir to the British throne. With help from the French military, James II left France and arrived in Ireland in March of 1689. The Irish Parliament declared that he should remain king and equally enacted a Bill of Attainder against those who did not support this. This bill essentially made it so that those in opposition could be stripped of their rights and property. From this point on, James began work to rebuild an army. The Jacobites, led by John Graham of Claverhouse, also known as Viscount Dundee, and government forces commanded by General Hugh Mackay, met near the pass of Killiecrackie in the Scottish Highlands. The battle began with a Highland charge by the Jacobites. Dundee led his troops in a fierce and terrifying assault. Despite being outnumbered, the Jacobites gained an early advantage due to their ferocity and the surprise of their charge. However, the battle took a decisive turn when Viscount Dundee was killed by a musket ball. His death caused confusion and disarray among the Jacobites, but they ultimately defeated the government forces. Less than a month later, on August 21, 1689, the Jacobites attempt a rising in and around the town of Dunkeld in central Scotland. The Jacobite forces in this engagement were led by Alexander Cannon, who assumed command after Viscount Dundee's death. The army consisted of Highland clansmen and some Irish troops who supported James II. The government forces were commanded by General Hugh Mackay, the same general who had led them at Killiecrankie. Mackay's force was composed of government troops loyal to King William III, including regular infantry and artillery. The Jacobites initially launched an attack on the town, which was held by government forces. The fighting was intense, with both sides suffering casualties. The Jacobites managed to capture part of Dunkeld and set fire to some buildings. However, they failed to take the entire town. Following the initial attack, the Jacobites laid siege to Dunkeld. The town was fiercely defended by the government forces, who held out despite being outnumbered. The siege of Dunkeld lasted for several weeks, and it was a grueling and brutal affair. In the end, government reinforcements arrived under the command of General Thomas Livingstone. The Jacobites, lacking heavy artillery and facing dwindling supplies, were forced to abandon the siege. On July 1, 1690, William III led the Williamite army, which consisted of predominantly Protestant troops, including Dutch, English, and Scottish soldiers. James II commanded the Jacobite army, 
comprised mainly of Irish Catholics and a small contingent of French troops. The two armies faced off along the banks of the River Boeing. William's forces attempted to cross the river to engage James's army. The battle began with artillery fire and skirmishes along the river banks. The critical moment of the battle came when William III personally led a successful crossing of the river at a location known as the Ford of the Williamites. His army, facing tough resistance, managed to establish a bridgehead on the southern bank of the Boyne. The Jacobites put up a determined defense, but were eventually forced to retreat. Despite the retreat, the battle was not a total rout for James's forces. They withdrew in an orderly manner, and many troops survived. The following year, on July 12, 1691, Irish Jacobites were defeated at the Battle of Agram by Williamite forces. The Jacobites were forced to retreat, and their defenses broke. In August of that same year, William of Orange offers a pardon to all Jacobites in the Scottish Highlands who swear allegiance by year end. In October 1691, the Treaty of Limerick was signed. Some of the key provisions of the treaty were for religious tolerance of Catholics in Ireland and protection of property and civil rights for Catholics equal to those of Protestants. These provisions lasted for a while, but were not upheld over time. An interesting provision allowed for Irish soldiers and officers who had fought on the side of the Jacobites to either join William III's army or return home, but in either case, without retribution. It did, however, include another provision for Catholics to take an oath of allegiance to King William and Queen Mary, forcing their authority to be recognized. By January of 1692, King William III issued an order to discipline the Highland Scots, meaning that military action could be taken against them if they did not swear allegiance. Part of this order led to the Glencoe Massacre. On February the 13th, 1692, the Macdonald chief was late taking his oath to King William due to bureaucratic delays. Government troops arrived, led by Captain Robert Campbell, and were quartered in Glencoe by their hosts, the Macdonalds. The Campbells were allies of the government, but they also had a long-standing feud with the Macdonalds. This became a perfect opportunity to settle scores. On that evening, the troops turned on their hosts and, along with members of the Campbell clan, killed 38 members of the MacDonald clan at Glencoe. The actions of that day were widely condemned, in Scotland and beyond, as a betrayal of the Highland Hospitality Code, along with a gross abuse of power. The massacre had a significant impact on the politics and culture of the Highlands, contributing to a legacy of mistrust between Highland clans and the central government. On June 12, 1701, the Act of Settlement was passed by Parliament, ensuring that if William III and Princess Anne, who was later Queen Anne, should die without heirs, the succession to the throne would pass to Sophia of Hanover, who was the granddaughter of James I, and to her heirs, as long as they were Protestants. The House of Hanover, which ruled Great Britain from 1714, owes its claim to this act. On September 16, 1701, the deposed King James II dies in France from a brain hemorrhage. Louis XIV of France recognizes his son James III as the rightful heir, later known as the Old Pretender. Roughly seven years later, on March 23, 1708, a French naval squadron attempted unsuccessfully to land the Old Pretender on the Firth of Forth near Edinburgh. The French ships encountered difficulties due to adverse weather conditions and the presence of British naval forces. After a brief skirmish, the French ships were forced to withdraw and return to Dunkirk. James and his Jacobite supporters were unable to establish a foothold in Scotland, and the mission was deemed a failure. The unsuccessful landing in 1708 marked a significant setback for the Jacobite cause. It demonstrated the difficulties of mounting a successful invasion of Britain and the challenges of rallying sufficient support for a rebellion. It would be several more years before another major Jacobite rising occurred. In 1715, there was such a Jacobite rising, known as the Fifteen Rebellion, or simply the Fifteen, which saw yet another attempt to seize the British throne in support of James Francis Edward Stuart's claim. The 1715 Jacobite Rising began in Scotland, led by John Erskine, the Earl of Mar, who was a former supporter of the House of Hanover. The Earl of Mar raised the Jacobite standard in Braemar in August of 1715, declaring his support for James Francis Edward Stuart. Jacobite forces, composed mainly of Highland clansmen, began to gather in support of the rebellion. The Jacobites had some initial successes, including capturing key towns like Perth and gaining control of parts of Scotland. Meanwhile, in England, there were smaller Jacobite risings in Northumberland, Lancashire, and Wales, but these were poorly coordinated and swiftly suppressed. On November 13th, the Battle of Sheriff Muir, 
which was fought near Stirling. This was an inconclusive battle, and both sides declared victory. The following day, a Scottish and English Jacobite force was defeated near Preston in northwest England. The following month, on December 22, 1715, the old pretender lands at Peterhead in northeast Scotland, joining Jacobites at Perth before returning to France on February the 4th, 1716. Between 1716 and 1722, while there were smaller plots to restore the Stuarts to the throne, much of this time was spent spreading pro-Jacobite propaganda and recruitment for their cause. With James Francis Edward Stuart in France, he was given a haven under Louis XIV. In the fall of 1722, the Atterbury Plot, also known as the Bishop's Plot, the Bishop of Rochester, Francis Atterbury, a Jacobite leader, was arrested and later exiled for his role in a conspiracy to overthrow King George I. The plot involved the spread of Jacobite propaganda, recruitment of supporters, and discussions of potential military intervention, possibly with the assistance of foreign powers. Between 1722 and 1745, the Jacobites continued their efforts to restore a Stuart to the British throne. During this period, they engaged in various activities, conspiracies, and diplomatic maneuvers in pursuit of their cause. Smaller plots and conspiracies periodically emerged, although they were often infiltrated by government spies and crushed by authorities. France remained a key center for Jacobite activities in exile. The Stuart Court in France, led by James Francis Edward Stuart, the Old Pretender, continued to operate and attracted Jacobite supporters. Jacobite agents and envoys traveled between France and Britain, seeking support from European powers and planning for a potential Jacobite rising. In 1744, during the War of the Austrian Succession, the French government, with Jacobite support, devised a plan to launch a full-scale invasion of Britain to restore the Stuarts. A French fleet was prepared, and James Stuart's son, Charles Edward Stuart, also known as Bonnie Prince Charlie, was set to sail to Scotland to lead the anticipated Jacobite uprising. His arrival in Scotland will be the start of part three in our series.